and thank you for joining for today's HPL seminar. Today we'll be hearing from Elizabeth Condliffe. Elizabeth is currently a clinical assistant professor at the University of Calgary with appointments in the Cummings School of Medicine and the Department of Clinical Neurosciences. She is also an adjunct in the Faculty of Kinesiology. Elizabeth completed her bachelor's in mechanical and aerospace engineering at Princeton University. Following, she pursued her, a master's in biomedical engineering at Boston University, where she explored post-stroke spasticity at the elbow. She then went on to obtain a PhD at the University of Alberta in biomedical engineering. Her PhD was advised by Monica Gorosini, and her dissertation title was Mechanisms of Motor Impairment in Spastic Cerebral Palsy. Elizabeth's current research interests include neurorehabilitation, neurophysiology, cerebral palsy, and robotic rehabilitation. In the future, she hopes to improve care of people with CP and other chronic disabilities. One of her proudest accomplishments is engaging in multidisciplinary work here at the University of Calgary. In her free time, Elizabeth loves having logical debates with her three-year-old and engaging in all sorts of human-powered transportation, like biking, walking, Nordic skiing, skating, swimming, and paddling. As a reminder, I'll first turn it over to Elizabeth for her presentation, and we'll have a um, question and answer period to follow. And at that time, I'll remind everyone how to submit questions. So with that, Elizabeth, you're welcome to start screen sharing, and we look forward to your presentation. Great. Thanks for that introduction. You should have my screen now. Looks great. Perfect. Um, and yeah, I, I think what we'll try to do, there's a couple logical breakpoints. So I'm happy to field questions when we get to that point. Uh, and we don't need to wait to the end. Um, happy to have a good discussion. This is sort of an evolving line of work and really would like to hear uh, some of the suggestions. Some of this is a little different than what I typically see being discussed at HPL seminars, but, but there is lots of room for overlap. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge that I am a settler living and working in the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. And of course, as most of you hopefully know at this point, the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Also relevant to, to this presentation is I'm not only able-bodied, but I'm a clinician, which of course comes with a set of biases and a clinician scientist to boot. Um, and I have some relevant financial disclosures, most of which are uh, grants with one uh, relationship with industry, but it is an unrestricted loan of a Trexo uh, robotic gait trainer. I, we're going to cover mainly three sections today. Uh, robotic gait trainers, how do they help with motor function, and what do they do beyond motor function? Uh, and in between each section is really when I think uh, we can have times for questions. So of course, if your questions relate to impact, maybe wait uh, until at least we're beyond just the robotic gait trainer section, because that's where I'll uh, be hopefully addressing some of them. But, but if there's any questions about the trainers themselves, uh, let's address those right at that section. Um, I think it's worthwhile to define what we're talking about, in this case, the robotic gait trainers. Um, and, and so we're going to start there. So this is often what people think about, uh, these overground, untethered robotic gait trainers. Uh, here on the left, we've got the wearable powered assist locomotor WPAL device. Uh, and you can see it's used with a walker. Uh, and it mounts to the inside of the legs, which has some advantages if you're trying to get up and sit down to, into a wheelchair. You don't have to transfer to another surface to get your device on and off. Um, the one in the middle is known as the EXO. Uh, and uh, it includes a backpack, but that also means it provides some trunk support. And then the one on the right is the Kyogo. This one, you need to be able to walk. It's only a partial assist at the hips and knees. All of these have the potential issue with falls. And in general, because of that, the FDA has defined all exoskeletons as class two devices that must be used with a clinical staff member, which has really uh, impacted the rollout for these as uses in the community. 
there are definitely some exceptions to that, and we'll talk. A little more about things you may not think of as robotic gate trainers, but on the far right, there's another untethered overground robotic gate trainer. The University of Alberta has one of these, the Rewalk. I forgot to mention when I showed you the EXO that uh, the Foothills Hospital has one of those. Um, and actually, the Glenrose Hospital in Edmonton also has an EXO. On the left here, we've got an Innowalk. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not available for sale in North America. To me, it looks more like a motorized stepper. They do have another one that uh, has arm motion that appears to be tied to the leg motion. Um, but interestingly, some of their publications and, and when people are doing reviews, they'll often include this type of device as a robotic gay trainer because of the stepping action. Also robotic gay trainer things that have nothing to do with the legs. But uh, this Endago here has robotic control of the partial body weight support that you're getting in this overground walking, keeping track of where the center of mass is getting support and doing it not just at the same height throughout the gait cycle. And of course there's more. Um, and, and really I have limited these pictures to ones that are relevant for people with difficulty walking. There, there are many more robotic gait trainers out there as well. And there's great variability in what they are. Uh, and as you can see, not, not all of them even walk. So here's one approach uh, of how do we think about this growing field. This is done by uh, Hugh van Hedel in Switzerland, he sort of tries to categorize things based on the level of impairment the target population is represented, whether they provide weight support or not, whether they are stationary, generally over a treadmill, um, or they're meant to be used over a ground, and whether they're tethered, uh, such as uh, uh, often with a gate track overhead, so that limits its use to a clinical advice, or truly untethered, such that it could be used um, like those initial ones I showed you in the community, potentially. And, and the spectrum goes much beyond what's shown here as we talked. The, the military is exploring robotic gate trainers to essentially aid in marching with very heavy packs. As I mentioned, it's, it's a really growing field. Um, in 2017, a systematic review had nine exoskeletons. A couple of years later, there were 25. I haven't seen the recent data of how many. Um, they're still somewhat limited. In the 2021 review, there were only six with either FDA approval or the CE mark, which is essentially the ability to sell in Europe. And they can vary quite greatly. Uh, you know, are they intended to be used? Uh, I, I have the hamster wheel, but this is really your treadmill. Or are they meant to be used over ground? Are they meant to be used in a hospital, a home? Or what about a community rec center? This is the logo for the Calgary Adapted Hub for those who aren't familiar with it. Do you use them with or without any gate aids? And what are those gate aids? Where on the spectrum of voluntary abilities is the target audience? What sort of actuators are involved? Is it just horizontal uh, leg motion they're supporting? Is the vertical motion supported? Uh, do they involve mechanical motors, which most of them do, but some involve some functional electrical stimulation. So actuating the mobility by stimulating through the muscle. What, what's the mechanism of control? Do you need your therapist, your clinician with the iPad there holding it, or a tablet, I should use the more generic term, um, or some have joystick control or watch control for the user. And there are some trying to be developed that actually are controlled by the voluntary activity of the user. So feedback from sensors like EMG. And then they're also quite variable about when do you take them on and off? How long do you take them on and off? And can you wear them all day? Essentially, robotic gay trainers can be many things. And if you wanted this in words, there, there it is. Uh, let's just look at a couple videos of just two examples. Um, this is one that has probably the most research on it. This is the Locomat. And as you can see, uh, it's clearly limited application to clinical settings. It is a big, expensive device, uh, but it can help people with a spectrum of abilities from unable to walk to functional, but potentially asymmetric gait that needs some improvements. It's got actuators at the hips and knees and vertical center of mass support with graded body weight support. 
generally controlled by someone else, but who sets sort of a path? What are the kinematics that it is expecting uh, the user to follow? And then there's a, a trajectory band around that um, path, sort of a tunnel, and with graded support to keep you within that tunnel, uh, depending on your activity. It actually looks pretty much like walking. Uh, when you look at the kinematics compared to uh, other treadmill walking, it's not too bad. Uh, but I could tell you, having been in one, it feels a lot odder uh, than just walking on a treadmill. Here's another example. This is the one I have the most experience with. This is a Trexo. Uh, here it's being used in a clinical setting, and we do have one at the Children's Hospital, but it can also be used uh, in the community. There's a child in Calgary who uses it daily at school. Like the locomat that we looked at, there's a little bit of this one, not robotically controlled, purely uh, response to body weight, but dynamic shift in the center of mass height. And like the locomat has robotic motors at the hips and knees. This one has the advantage it cannot fall. Uh, thanks to being built onto a commonly used walker for kids with disabilities. There are some definite size practicalities here. A similar device scaled for many adults would be rather large. Although interestingly enough, I can use the Trexo uh, and I am an adult. I just am a slightly small one. Uh, there are over 50 people around the world that are currently enrolled in our study of users. Uh, and, and all of those people are using it in their home and community settings because it doesn't have that restriction of needing to be used in a clinical environment. So, so some of those practicalities of innovating in the pediatric world, the lighter motors, the smaller size overall, help keep the cost down, help keep the practicalities down. And so it has probably some of the best uptake of the robotic gait trainers that we're gonna to discuss today. Some common features, and here, you know, I'm mostly focusing on the ones that are at least, they may not provide full assist, but they're capable of providing full assist. Because some of the ones that are just sort of enhancement of function, uh, like the Kyogo that I mentioned, aren't necessarily restricted to these parameters. But but they the ones that are capable of full assist walk and, and they walk, they just walk pretty slowly. For those of you who aren't familiar with speeds of 0.26 to 0.42 meters per second, the reason I put a turtle there is because you're not going to get across the street safely uh, in most cities going that speed. And the reason the horse is there is because the gait pattern often is more like dressage. So you may not have noticed looking at that Trexo gait pattern, but it was actually running very, very slowly, but there was a flight phase and no period of double support. Um, sometimes the, the control to initiate the step is also quite uh, dressage-like, just an abnormal pattern. Some of them require you to sort of lean forward and sideways, and that's what triggers the motor to take the step with the contralateral leg. Um, others almost seem like they're dancing with an exaggerated posterior kick in early swing. Uh, there are other limitations. Uh, while the military is building similar technology to essentially turn people into all-terrain vehicles, all the ones for clinical use are not. Most of them have troubles with just the smallest bump, a little bit of gravel, uh, turf, uh, and, and really uh, are not ready for participation in sports or anything like that yet. They very, very few can handle stairs or even just corners without significant effort or external support. They're, they're nowhere near ready for use on trails yet. And they're all quite costly. None of them are free. Um, being technology that's used by few uh, and often being seen as medical devices uh, adds to the cost issues. But some of these issues are definitely coming down in the seven or so years that I've been sort of paying attention to this field the cost is already in about half. What are they used for? Well, often we think of them as being used for neurorehabilitation, that heavy in plasticity of uh, neurons that fire together, wire together, and you're going to use this neuroplasticity to help with the recovery of functions like walking. But it can also be neurorehabilitation of other functions. One of the families involved in our uh, patient engagement in some of our research has a story of their eight-year-old with cerebral palsy required to be lifted to transfer from one service to another. So if you can imagine every time she needed to use the bathroom, she was lifted. 
She's eight. She's growing bigger. And in fact, her mom, a relatively young woman, had developed degenerative lower back disorder that you would generally expect to find in someone much older. And it led to a pinched nerve, a radiculopathy. Uh, Now, six weeks after she started using the robotic gait trainer, she started being able to transfer to the toilet on her own great things for her mother's back. But for her, it also increases the likelihood that she will live independently one day. She will no longer need someone else to control as you get bigger, generally a mechanical lift, not a parent lifting you. Um, But those mechanical lifts generally need someone else to drive them as well. And without the need for that, she could potentially live on her own. So this is a huge impact uh, on the rehabilitation function for her. But they're also an assisted device. The, the most common assisted device that people think of as a, are as a wheelchair. And, and I'll be honest, if I wanted a device for ease of mobility, I would definitely choose a wheelchair over any of the available robotic gait trainers. But, but an assisted device is anything that really helps in any way. Hearing aids or uh, help people hear. Technology helps keep us organized and help us in many ways. And, and really, the, for the robotic gait trainers, I, th- I think both roles are quite valuable. So a little more about neurorehabilitation and the recovery of walking. This is just a case of uh, someone who used a Trexo. And uh, in August of 2019, he didn't do any walking independently. He got a Trexo 13 months later, 500,000 steps later in his Trexo. He is walking in what looks like a Trexo, but you'll notice the robotic gait training parts are gone. Uh, And he no longer has a Trexo because he walks so well independently. So there are these like really phenomenal cases you hear about of how it's made such a hugely impactful rehabilitation effect. Oh, and sorry, there's the video of him walking. You can see it's not just a photo of him standing, but he is taking independent steps, initiating himself and getting around to the room. So why all this talk beyond rehabilitation about an assisted device? This this scale I'm showing you is known as the Gross Motor Function Classification System, the GMFCS, and it really was established for children with CP. But I'm using it here as just an illustrative way of thinking of the spectrum of what we may mean by difficulty with walking. And really, the robotic gait trainer population is the group that's in the levels three through five. They may be able to walk, but generally require handheld gait aids, even for short distances, and may require wheelchairs for longer distances, all the way down to no ability to have uh, voluntary stepping uh, down at this level five here. Generally, they're pushed by others. They don't have enough voluntary control to drive a manual wheelchair, and they often need support even for, for sitting upright, not just at the trunk, but in the head. And... Again, this is a schematic that is specific to pediatrics, but relevant really to anyone that we need to remember that we need to think beyond just walking and mobility. And and they call this the six F's of childhood disability and things we need to think about and priorities. And really it helps highlight many of the other needs of people who are unable to walk in, in community settings. The inability to walk not always, but often translates to a difficulty achieving physical activity and exercise. And with that can cause, can come with constipation, sleep disturbance. Often there are related balance impairments. There can be impacts on mood and pain, uh, as well as social isolation. And in the long term, people who do not walk in community settings have high rates of chronic conditions like diabetes and heart disease. Now the Injury or lesion that results in the difficulty walking often comes with other impairments, such as cognitive impairments or communication impairments, that are all things that would be great to assist with. So here's just a couple fun uh, videos of cute kids who are using a robotic gait trainer. Uh, And while they didn't get a head sort of face on shot of the girl on the left, hopefully you could tell she is having fun. Uh, and, uh, the gentleman on the right, he uses his robotic gait trainer to walk, to get the mail with his family every day. So he is participating in a different way, in a way that they all seem to enjoy, uh, that is very different than how he would do it if he was using a wheelchair. 
So that uh, concludes my, my brief introduction to robotic gait trainers. And I'd like to take any questions that might be related to this area at this time. You're, you're welcome to raise hands, uh, put them in the chat. Um, we'll give a couple minutes and if nothing comes in, I'll just keep rambling. It's weird to like, I don't, actually, I'm going to jump in with a question, Elizabeth. Um, the video you showed of the boy who's still, he was using the walker, but without the, the robotic attachment. It looked like there were still straps around his feet. Do you explain what those are? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are uh, guides on his feet. So I highly suspect he is not uh, one of the patients in our study. Um, he got his trainer before we started our study, but uh, I highly suspect the those guides are used because he continues to have some spastic motor impairment where he has involuntary muscle activity during the gait cycle. And many people with cerebral palsy uh, have it where it's actually in their adductors. So those guides are preventing his legs from crossing and tripping over his feet from tripping over themselves. Walter. Yeah, just a quick question to the uh, to the rehabilitation effects. Can you actually quantify mm -hmm. uh, neuromuscular learning? Uh, you know, can you quantify it in some manner? Uh, how they get better and how much can be associated with improvements of the neuromechanics compared to just strengths, muscle strengths, because now they walk and they get some training and that presumably helps as well. Yeah, yeah. You're about five years ahead of what we can actually do at this point or what we have done at this point that I'm aware of. There are a few small studies that have gone after things like that. And actually, there's some studies coming out of a few of the groups in Japan that are looking at that acutely post-stroke. Um, but at this point, mo most of the research is just do these things even cause improvements in walking or in strength? Um, so, so I started with all the very positive cases of what it might do. Um, and we are going to talk about what we know it does and what we don't know that it does or know that it doesn't clearly do uh, in the coming sections. But we don't have that mechanistic piece yet. I, I would really like to go after some of that mechanistic piece to because I think one of the big issues with rehabilitation research in general is we have a new intervention and then we just apply it to everyone. And then the trials come out somewhat not clearly answering things, but we didn't do the preliminary research to figure out who should we apply it to. Great, thanks. Any other questions before Elizabeth continues? Okay, so now I'm going to try and address some of those uh, impacts, uh, particularly as they relate to motor function, but but even more, uh, I guess, functional and, and less mechanistic than, than what Walter was asking about, specifically talking about walking uh, balance and spasticity. So, so starting with walking, do robotic gait trainers make a difference for walking? So one of the early systematic reviews was really positive, looking at that locomat that we looked at the video on early on, and then looking at walking, not using that locomat, using a 10 meter walk test. So you look at the time of how that, um, how long they take to do that 10 meter walk test. And, and really, if you can make improvements on that, you're making likely meaningful differences in how someone gets around their house, their home called household ambulation. They also looked uh, at two minute or six minute walk tests, how far you can walk in these relatively short timeframes. But this is often relevant for what we call limited community ambulation. Someone who can walk from the car to the store on level ground in good weather, uh, not in a very distraction rich environment necessarily, but, but having some limited community ambulation makes a big difference for independence. And then there were a few clinical scales that rated walking abilities. Generally, how do you walk in these different settings in real life? And how much do you need gait aids, a wheelchair, or help from others to achieve different mobility tasks, like getting out of bed, getting onto a toilet, uh, getting to a store, getting your groceries, and things like that. And it was quite positive. 
uh, looking like there was a difference with uh, robotic gait training. Unfortunately, the later systematic reviews, um, more recently, both of these published last year, were not as positive. In general, people with spinal cord injury were not finding remarkable differences. Uh, and, and in the five randomized control trials that included people post-stroke, there was a potential tendency to show effects, but with just five trials and not giant effect sizes, uh, they couldn't draw any firm conclusions. The review that looked at uh, people with cerebral palsy noted that five of 13 studies showed an increase in gait speed with people with cerebral palsy. And it really, if you're putting policy on something that happens just over a third of the time, uh, you're probably not doing it. So, so, so do we give up? Um, and, and I'm just going to show one more really positive story before you get too doom and gloom on uh, But, but this is Griffin. He's on that scale, the gross motor function classification system four. So he will do walking for therapy, as you can see in this video, but has no functional ambulation. He uses a wheelchair and generally a power wheelchair. And you can see in this video, he has difficulty initiating even single steps, needing a little sensory cue or some feedback from the, uh, his mother who's in the video with him. After just two months of using a robotic gait trainer, this is how he walked. You can see he's initiating steps on his own. Uh, he can actually cover distance in a reasonable amount of time. And, and really importantly for those six Fs of disability, he's using his walker now to play soccer uh, and having fun. Um, and and uh, one of the families partnering with our research had a similar experience where a child went from hating her walker to coincidentally playing walker soccer, uh, an actual organized sport in her community and, and enjoying it. Uh, interestingly, the, these anecdotes aren't alone. In a Canadian study involving adults with spinal cord injury training in that rewalk, it was not designed to detect differences in uh, walking. It was designed really to, to capture some of the other changes. But one of the eight people involved in that study who could not walk without the gait trainer uh, beforehand walked without any gait trainer afterwards. Um, so essentially, I don't think we should give up, but I, I think we really need to address who it's benefiting, you know, Walter set me up perfectly with the question, who is it benefiting and how is it uh, causing benefits for those people so that we can really figure out who we should be getting involved in these trials uh, when neuro rehab is the goal. There's other pieces of neuro rehab though as well. Um, so, so one of the things uh, that, that I've wondered about is, is head control. Uh, Nina, who's pictured here, uh, you'll see it in a couple slides. Um, I really got involved learning about Nina because her family uh, got her a Trexo to see if it would cause her some joy and asked me to get involved and see what else it did. And so we looked at the early clinical assessment of balance. And, and the only part of that score that she could do was the head control subscore. Uh, and she could just do part of it at baseline. And then over the first few weeks, there was some invariable effects, but really relatively quickly by three weeks, she'd had a significant improvement. And, and for any of you pure scientists, uh, you're going to look at my data and you say, well, do you really trust that baseline measure? Why didn't you do multiple baselines and know that this was stable? Uh, we, we didn't because of some of the entertaining logistics of doing uh, research with a company was that we got a week's notice uh, that the Trexo was coming um, after thinking it wasn't coming for a little while. And so we only had time to get one baseline measure in. But, but I do think this effect is real. And that's because the family also noticed that they didn't need to support her head as much when she was using the gait trainer, or sorry, when they were transferring her to, from surfaces to surfaces. And when she was using the gait trainer or using her standing frame, so she's not actually mobile, but she's upright and standing and supported, um, or even sitting in her wheelchair, she was looking around more and having more uh, engagement, which is really relevant because we know that type of uh, engagement is very important for cognitive development. 
And so I was really fortunate to have Sunaina, who is a summer student in the lab last year, uh, get involved with some of the families who are in our observational study of people from around the world uh, who are using it, sent us home videos. And they sent us home videos within the, the first month of when they were using a gay trainer. And they sent us home videos three months later of using a gay trainer. And Sunaina went through and looked at the position in the sagittal plane of the head. Uh, you will see this is clearly not a well-controlled gate lab, but we've made a few efforts to control for where the plane of the camera is. Um, and what we found, uh, here's some data for you, is the maximum head angle from vertical is plotted at three time points because we asked for data, although we often didn't get it, at baseline one month and three months. And if we just look at our baseline data, there are these horizontal lines here that correspond to when this measure is looked at in kids uh, who are typically developing walking over ground, a published norm of their maximum head angle, and then a standard deviation above that publ published norm, sort of showing that all the kids in our study at baseline uh, or even the ones who sent us data at one month were, were above this published norm. Uh, which is obviously different. Uh, we don't have data of what typically developing kids' uh, head control is like in uh, Trexo, but it suggests that, that head control might be an issue, which fits with the clinical picture and everything the families are telling us. What I find really interesting, and unfortunately, there's a limited number of families who sent us videos at two time points, but Everyone who sent us videos at time points, except one family who's not plotted because their child has a progressive condition, everyone clearly had a reduction in that maximum head angle, uh, suggesting there might, in fact, be a robust uh, improvement in head control happening as well. There's another study involving another overground robotic assist gait trainer, Angel Legs, um, that included a small number of people with cerebral palsy and looked at some clinical scales, the pediatric balance scale and the gross motor function measure, uh, and the aspect of that uh, scale that is dependent on balance. And both of those improved as well. So I don't think we're crazy to think that somehow this dynamic mobility uh, is having an impact on balance and, and whether it be through strength, that's possible. And some people argue that I, I think it's more through a neuroplastic effect in the control of the movement. Um, so what about other populations and, and measures of balance? The Berg balance scale is a really commonly used measure of balance in adults, particularly geriatrics or post-stroke. Uh, and uh, this is a forest plot. For any of you who are familiar with that, this is an effect size that's plotted, taking multiple different studies and weighting them depending on the number of participants. Uh, and this is just the bottom of it. So, so the overall effect size, and they found it to be about 3.6 points uh, on the Berg balance scale when you translate it back to that score. Um, and, and that is above the minimal detectable change uh, that is published in the stroke population. That would be 2.7. Um, so, so this is uh, seeming to be a consistent impact on balance. Now, within this systematic review, they tried to look a little bit at some populations, and they do think the effect sizes are bigger in the acute or subacute population, uh, and also in those who trained more than 10 hours a day. Or sorry, 10 hours total, not 10 hours a day. <laughs> Might be half an hour a day over 20, 20 days or, or uh, probably even longer and not training every day in most studies. Here's another example. This is one using the rewalk in people with spinal cord injury. And I'm just showing the individual data for two individuals, but they did a limits of stability test for seated balance where you're sitting and then you lean toward targets in different directions. And in this individual, you could see they had very, very limited limits of stability and it got a little bit bigger afterwards. Uh, and in this person, they started, I mean, the, the between individual difference is much bigger than the before and after distance they just started much stronger, but they were highly asymmetric and they got less asymmetric and broader limits of stability afterwards. Um, sort of a small improvement and a large improvement, 
Uh, but, but taken as a group, the 10 people in this study uh, improved in, in their balance. So I think this is a neural rehab effect that, that is uh, probably more consistent uh, and worth exploring. What about uh, other aspects of motor function and impairment? Uh, we talked a little bit at the question about spasticity. So that's involuntary muscle activity. Often it's measured passively. Uh, and there's some debate of what the passive measurement means, but it's typically what guides a lot of clinical interventions. And so we did that in our case with Nina. Uh, and we looked at um, many muscles actually for her, but the one where we saw a pattern actually makes sense because there were actuators uh, extending her knees. Uh, and so in her knee flexors, this angle of catch, 180 degrees would be full extension. And when we moved her limb quick, on the left, we originally faced resistance at about 50 degrees. And on the right, it was at about 90. And both became a more extended position in the latter two months uh, every time we measured her. And we measured her two weeks, which is why there's error bars across here. So the, the one month assessment includes three assessments. And then um, we measured her three times in the period of time, two to three months and again. So there appeared to be a suggestion. Uh, time point. Another very relevant type of spasticity is spasms that I'm showing here. And I just got an internet unstable. So hopefully you can uh, see that video. This is an individual with a spinal cord injury, and she is unable to move any aspect of her legs on her own using her own muscles. You can see she can move them, lifting them with her hands. But the sensory trigger of uh, being dropped can trigger a spasm. Some people will use these spasms functionally because they can trigger some voluntary activity that will momentarily maintain their weight if they're transferring. But for many people, they're more problematic. They can cause pain. They can cause uh, difficulty staying seated. If you have a spasm, it moves you on your seat involuntarily and all that shear forces can lead to wounds. Um, they can cause people to fall out of chairs. For, for this individual, I have seen it caught, trigger when she didn't want it during a transfer. And all of a sudden she went from almost in the car to on the ground. Uh, and, and the impacts with robotic gait training, just the fact that you're doing this much weight bearing movement uh, in some studies suggests an improvement in spasms. But those uh, on the review were quite mixed. So there are studies that didn't show any, any impact. So I think with spasticity, it really matters what you measure essentially. Oh, and that video wants to go again. So I'm just hitting another break point. If there's any questions about the impacts on motor function, I'd love to take them now. We're going to talk about things more the assisted device beyond motor function after this. So, so uh, if there are any motor function related questions, I know this group's an expert there. Maybe I'll ask a, a quick question, Elizabeth. Um, with the with the head angle, mm -hmm. um, what's the what's the problem with with having the you know, like a, a, a bouncy head or a weak neck? Is it you want, you need stable gaze or is it a thing about comfort or safety? Like what is, like, I'm sure it matters, but I'm just yeah. wondering what's the most important thing? Why? Yeah. All, all, all of the above. Yeah. Um, so, so safety, you'll actually notice in that picture I keep showing you with Nina, she's got a collar on holding her head within a certain limit. Be, be, because safety, when you have limited head control, if you had an impulse externally that really flung your neck and you don't have enough motor uh, power or tone there, um, you can actually get a cervical spinal cord injury. Um, oh, wow. uh, fortunately, it's extremely rare, uh, but it's obviously something we take great lengths to be quite cautious about. Um, uh, so, but, but more so because um, you can, uh, wear a collar. Uh, the many people don't necessarily need a collar. Um, and in when we quantified it, it was just people who weren't wearing collars because obviously a collar would impact the head angle. So this was their voluntary control. Um, it impacts social interactions. Uh, people are more comfortable talking to someone whose head is upright. It is also easier to look someone in their eye when your head is upright and not 
tilted. Um, it impacts uh, control of walking, as you say. Uh, if you have more control of your head position, it probably uh and, and you may have perceptual deficits with vision, which are quite common in, in people with brain lesions that cause difficulties with walking. So you're more dependent on your vestibular system, but your vestibular system is getting unpredictable input depending on where you're at. And it may not relate to your body's position. Um, uh, so, so, and, and if you can't, do have good vision, your vision is less reliable because your head's bouncing around. Um, so, so, uh, social motor control, the, the whole safety, the whole gamut. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Maybe, maybe just a quick question, if I may. Um, when you showed the, the balance control there, you know, the before and after, uh, I wasn't quite sure what, what you actually showed there. I just saw there was a, a smaller excursion before and then a bigger one after. And, and how, how do you interpret that? And, and what, what, what is it actually that you show there? Uh, is this the, the plot when we were looking at head control? Uh, no, I think it was one after that. I think you, you were saying it was sitting balance, I think. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the spider-like. The stability. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my apologies for not explaining that. So, so the participant is instructed to lean as far as they can and still get back. Okay. Oh, and then in the after plot, they went into different directions further. Yeah. Yeah. So indicating so that okay. they have, uh, I think it's eight targets of yeah. where directions are to lean into. Uh, and then in the, the one person who had very limited limits of excursion, their, their sort of ball went like this to this. Uh, and then in the other individual, it was highly asymmetric, sort of like this. And then it sort of poofed out a bit here and poofed a bit in this direction, but they definitely had more symmetrical control and, and they were able to control their body in more uh, areas. You know, the, the, how does the functional correlate of this? The, the one example would be if you end up, you know, you, you get perturbed, you're then able to get back from that position. But, but the one that most patients will tell us about more is being able to reach for things. Um, so, so if you're more, comfortable. You're not just your arm span. You can start getting reach for things farther out. Um, being able to reach down and catch something that falls makes a big difference to individuals, independence and ability to live alone. Um, and uh, so that's where the clinical scales are actually better at picking that up. Um, but sometimes we wonder why the clinical difference happened. Was it confidence or did their skill actually improve? Uh, and so here we're showing skill actually improved. Yeah, good. Yeah, that makes sense now. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions about the motor functions? I know we got a couple of people who think a fair bit about spasticity and I sort of glossed over that part, but that's okay. We all care about what you do more with what you could do than, than how spasticity messes it up. So, so I'll move on to, to beyond motor function. So, so, here, I, I sort of have categorized it into three areas. One, one is the experience of walking, one's physical activity, and then really be, beyond being active, being less inactive, and then having less consequences of significant inactivity level. So, so why think about this? You know, one, one of the systematic reviews, there, anyone else notice there've been a lot of systematic reviews since COVID hit? Um, but, but, but in one of them, it was really interesting. It was a study that had three case studies and 10 case series, and it concluded that the evidence they reviewed let, supported that robotic gait training was had a transformative role in the lives of people impacted by cerebral palsy. It was, it was just of people with cerebral palsy. Um, and that's, you know, an exciting, but bold conclusion. And then you realize not only was there level of evidence uh, just from case studies and case series and not from even cohort studies or controlled experimental studies, but, but also they were only looking at gait pattern and energy expenditure and, and not other things that impact the, the lives of, of people with disabilities. So, so they, they might actually, I'm not sure I disagree with them. The more I learn, the more I'm realizing they might be right. And this is a pretty cool technology that's going to shift how we manage people. Uh, but I don't think we can say that confidently yet. And in fact, uh, another review that came out last year <laughs> was really uh, 
um, critical of the field and, and said, you know, there's much too much. It was, it was a review on robots and pediatric rehab in general, but much too much focus on improving physical function in complete ignoring of what the kids actually wanted. And this is leading to a whole bunch of cool devices being designed and then being completely rejected. Uh, rejected of the devices is not all the needs of children with disabilities are being considered. And so let's think a little bit beyond in some of the needs of kids with disabilities. So, so here's Nina again, our, our little case study. Um, and, and really I have to give credit to Krista Dio here. Um, she's a therapy assistant at the Children's Hospital who was interested in getting involved in research and really moving the field forward. And uh, had she not come to me around the same time that Nina's family came to me, I don't know that I could have done this study. Um, Nina's family wanted to know if it would bring her joy. And so we created this emoticon scale and we thought it would be great. But Nina has difficulties with um, communication and, and any voluntary movement. So this scale had to be filled out by proxy. And unfortunately, when we went back and looked at the data as it was coming out, we could the data tracked more with the handwriting of who filled it out than it did with any activity of what she was doing and how much she'd used the Trexo that day. And we actually think it related more to which caregiver um, rated different moods uh, under different emoticons than it did to the joy she was feeling. But, but in chatting with her family, it did meet their goal of bringing her joy. And there's some great examples. Um, it became an activity that her older brother and his friend wanted to do with her. They weren't being asked to play with her, but, you know, hey, let's go for a walk with Nina. Let's play with this cool gadget. And so that was a new form of participation she got to participate in. Um, there's also just a phenomenal video that I'm never going to be able to show in, in a public setting because you see the faces of her entire school lined up in the library the first time she walked with the Trexo in school. Uh, and you can just see the awe and the wow. And you can even hear one voice going, wow, is that Nina? Um, and, and that's an experience, be, being the person that's doing something to be admired and, and that she does not get other ways. Uh, and, and while she has some difficulty with communication, it was clear to everyone that she was enjoying that experience. She, she trained in the track so longer that day than she had ever up until that point. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's really, uh, it's really obvious if you could see the video, but I can't get permission from all those families. <laughs> um, and, and really our observations with Nina have led us to launching another study, uh, we're going to look at the pragmatics of communication because her family has noticed that she has more opportunity to interact and communicate with her peers uh, when she's in the hall in her Trexo than when she's in the hall in her wheelchair. And, and I think some of this may have to do with the Trexo being super cool, but it's interesting. She's had it now for a couple of years and this seems to be something they keep noticing. So it's not just the novelty of the Trexo. Some of it may actually have to do with the, the upright mobility uh, and not looking down and being lower as typically is done in the uh, wheelchair. There's a, another great story from some of our collaborators in Ottawa, uh, again, just showing the pride in, in the child there who had a Trexo and was really excited to bring his friends in to say, come see his robo. Uh, you know, he had the cool thing for show and tell, which was somewhat different for many people who have significant disabilities. So they actually did a good qualitative study using a different robotic gait trainer, the solo walk, uh, and really looking at all sorts of qualitative outcomes. Uh, and many of the comments of things they found here are really related to the practicalities of rehab. But if we focus in on uh, the ones I've sort of highlighted here, you, you could see there's some suggestion that something about robotic gait training is different than, than other inter interventions. Uh, and it is assisting in other ways. They've even got a category of social advantages and, and disadvantages. Um, uh, so let's probe some of those a little more and go after this physical activity uh, piece. So here we are with the in a walk. 
Um, and I think when I first introduced it, I sort of told you, it looks to me like it's a, it's a stepping machine that we might use at a gym. Um, and indeed you can find out, uh, even the, when children are using it and it assists with the stepping, uh, they are meeting heart rate targets significant or, um, consistent with moderate to vigorous physical activity. So they are getting some exercise, uh, assisted by the robotic aid trainer. The, the data in people with spinal cord injury uh, using the overground exoskeletons is interesting. Often, you know, many of us might track a wearable sensor to keep track of our steps as an indicator of physical activity. And there it's clearly providing physical activity. In many people, robotic aid trainers are providing steps that they could not take otherwise. Uh, and for people who could take steps, generally they are taking them in the trainer faster than they would take otherwise. Uh, but interestingly, if we look at the rate of perceived exertion, it's not very intense activity. People do not think they're getting a lot of exercise. It's light to very light activity in the robotic gait trainers. However, they're reporting being fatigued. So they're feeling tired and that's why they're stopping training. Um, but they are noticing that they're working hard. Some of this might have to do with some of the impacts on cardiovascular control that having a spinal cord injury has, because when they actually measure, um, the, the metabolic equivalence, uh, is more consistent with moderate intensity. So what have we done in this area? We, we looked at physical activity in terms of steps with Nina, and she did indeed take 865 steps a week on average uh, across the first 12 weeks she had the Trexo, and those were 865 steps uh, a week that she would take more than she would typically take. Um, we also use a, a PROMIS. So the PROMIS stands for a Patient Report Outcome Measurement Instrument System. And there is a validated physical activity measure for parent proxy in children. And so we asked the families from around the world who are involved in our study to send us their data uh, and to send it at baseline in one month. And one of the interesting quirks of doing observational studies this way is you don't get all your data. Um, but my research coordinator, Ben, and a medical student, Anya, have worked really hard to try and get some of it and to collaborate with Trexo, who's reminding people to send us the data. Um, and we have some. And so if we look at it, the, the promise is a graded score so that a 50 is where the T-score is at a general population. So anything below 50 suggests you're getting less physical activity than the average child, anything above 50 is more. And, and it's uh, being a T-score, you think of your bell curve. Uh, and so being down here is really um, extremely low percentile. Uh, and even our median here um, is quite low. So in general, people in our study, their parents are reporting that they're getting less physical activity than one would expect of children. Uh, but we didn't see a significant change uh, after one month. Sure, our median's above zero, but, but this is clearly not a significant difference. Interestingly, when we get some qualitative advice from our families, they say this is a terrible scale for the scale for this population. You know, it asks us if our kids sweat, and because of some of the other things going on with our child, they never sweat. Sweating is not a good indicator of physical activity, and it's really just only four or five questions, and it's not getting at a good measure. Uh, so, so it does appear um, that we're not able to measure in this home users that it's causing physical activity. However, when it can, we come back to the steps, they are taking over 750 steps on a week on average. And in fact, if we just look at the subgroup that reported us data at baseline in one month, which is really biased to the subgroup of people who didn't have technical and supply chain issues in their first month, we see that they're taking over a thousand steps a week. Uh, this is this is a lot, and it's a lot more than zero. It's infinitely more than zero. But I'll remind you that 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 guy I showed you at the beginning, who no longer uses the trick, so used it a lot more. He had almost over nine thousand steps a week over his thirteen months. Now people do tend to use it more as the months go on, but that data is not available yet. So what about some of the sequelae of inactivity? We we all know that uh, cardio respiratory disorders and body composition are impacted by physical activity. And generally I'd say these are still open questions. 
There is a good set of studies led by Ann Spungen in New York, who was interested in secondary medical impacts of spinal cord injury uh, and started looking at how these were impacted using one of the overground robotic gait trainers. She found that VO2 improved uh, after a period of training. Uh, and she also found that uh, total body fat mass uh, improved. Separately, there was a systematic review done before most of her research came out that looked across uh, in people with spinal cord injury and noticed that there uh, were clear cardiorespiratory benefits um, and uh, related to uh, the um, sorry, VO2, measured VO2s, I believe. I'm drawing a blank on that one study. That picture's not telling me. The, the one bit of caution I, I have to say for, for interpreting really are the lungs and heart impacted is that those studies have been based on people with spinal cord injury, and we know that the autonomic control is different. Uh, so the response to intervention might also be different. What about other things? So these are the ones I call the, the short-term impacts of inactivity. For any of you who've uh, been bedridden for any week at any point, you may notice that uh, you become constipated. It's very common. Um, and uh, so we decided to look at it in our case study with Nina. And in fact, she went from having bowel movements less than uh, every other day to more than one bowel movement a day. And qualitatively, her family and caregivers told us they thought they were softer and easier to pass. So we put a questionnaire about bowel habits into our observational study. And again, we had 27 people who had data at one month um, at this point. And uh, 15 of them, interestingly, were not constipated. And our definition of constipation was, was pretty conservative. Uh, it was if you have bowel movements two or fewer times a week, um, or if you have to take medication to support your bowel movements. So the 12 people who met that definition, uh, eight of them had improvements in their bowel habits. Two had no change. Uh, and two, we cannot tell. And this is indicated by they're, they're defecating more frequently, but they also had an in increase in the meds was the case in one. And in the other one, they're defecating less frequently, but they decreased their medication. Um, so I think, I think something is indeed going on uh, in, related to bowel habits in the children who are using robotic gay trainers. Uh, and there was a systematic reviews once again, <laughs> Uh, focusing in spinal cord injury uh, and, and a specific spinal cord injury quality of life subscore that looked at bowel management difficulties uh, and found that the there were, um, th this scale is from one study, but it shows you pretty consistent improvements. Every individual had improvements. It's just the magnitude of the improvement is different. And, and in a systematic review, they, they found 61% of studies look, that they looked at had uh, improvements in bowel habits. So I do think there is an impact there. Sleep is another sort of sequelae of inactivity. This is, again, the promise we used from our parent report outcome measure system, looking at sleep disturbances. Here, there's actually established cutoffs. If you're in this light yellow zone, you have mild sleep disturbance. Uh, if you're in the orange zone, you have moderate sleep disturbance. And in the pink zone, you have severe sleep disturbance. So everyone who uh, has a Trek show has more sleep disturbance than the median. So a score higher than 50. Not everyone has mild, moderate, or severe sleep disturbance, but quite a few people do. And when we look at our change scores, uh, it's pretty clear that many people uh, are having a reduction in their sleep disturbance. This is actually not a measure that's been looked at much in the literature. Uh, and and one, one of the systematic reviews really looked at multiple interventions and in multiple populations just sort of had a line in there that they're like, yeah, in MS, robotic gait training has a study that looked at sleep and showed improvements. Uh, but I think this is something that's quite important. Uh, any of you who have been a caregiver for someone who's sleeping not well, you know it doesn't just impact the cognitive social behavior of that individual, but it also impacts your cognitive social um, behavior the next day and, and chronically as well. 
So just in quick summary, we, we talked about robotic gait trainers and the diversity of th things they actually are. Uh, some of their impacts on walking, balance, spasticity. We didn't talk about strength, but but uh, Walter set me up beautifully by saying, hey, is that maybe why some of this is happening and, and we're not sure? Uh, and some of the impacts beyond motor function, whether it be joy, pride, self-esteem, the physical activity, the and then sort of the consequences of inactivity. And before I take a final set of questions, I just wanna make a few significant acknowledgements, particularly any of the participants in, in our research uh, and in the research that we cite, but I've been really lucky to work with some really engaged participants. Uh, Trexo Robotics has been uh, quite comfortable to, we have a data sharing agreement where they, they just send us how much people are using the Trexo. We agree not to reveal their proprietary information, but they have, no restrictions on how we use the data. We have some funding. Uh, and of course I have a great team of which I have some photos at this point and hopefully we can get together for a group photo soon. With that, I'd love to hear any other questions or, or in particular, any other suggestions for this line of research. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, at this time, I kindly encourage the audience members that if they're comfortable to please turn on their Zoom camera to allow for better discussion. And you can uh, ask your question by using the raise hand function or type your question in the chat and I can read it aloud. Walter, go ahead. Yeah, let me start out with a question while everybody else is uh, thinking. Um, I, I was wondering, you know, if, if I'm in school and have difficulties walking, I, I would prefer a wheelchair over a Trexel because it seems to be faster, more efficient, like, you know. Um, so, so why, would you, why would you actually mm -hmm. use the Trexel? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I think when I was talking about assistive devices, if I was picking an assisted device for mobility and engagement and participation, I'd pick a wheelchair too. Um, why would you use a, a Trexo? So, so Nina uses it in the halls at recess time. She actually has difficulty propelling her own wheelchair. Um, and so even, even driving a power wheelchair. Uh, and so it gives her more interactions and some, ex and some exercise uh, at recess time as the other kids are coming in and out. Um, I don't think she often takes it outside, but last time I talked to them, it was still winter. Um, so she really prefers it then for the social interaction and, and uh, makes that easier at school when she's not in a hurry, when she's on a break. It, it is hard to know her preferences because she doesn't speak, um, okay. but, but her family feels that way. Um, yeah. And certainly the caregiver at school uh, thinks she's enjoying it and, and that interaction. Um, the other reason to use it would be to get that exercise. Yeah. So, so, of course. Um, so, but, but as a mobility aid, um, maybe as a rehabilitation effect for some kids, I think there's going to be an effect, but, but no, I would, it, the, the control systems are getting better, but they need to get a lot better. Uh, they need to handle curbs and corners and all sorts of things before it's a, a practical mobility aid. So some of the overground robotic gait trainers, the, the rewalk and the XO try to do that. The, the, the rewalk has great videos of sort of their flagship uh, user walking around. Uh, I forget what city he's in um, and using it as his mobility aid. And he can do stairs, which he can't do in his wheelchair, which gets him access to some buildings in his city that don't have proper ramp access. Um, but it's still pretty slow and he probably is faster in his wheelchair. Have people ever looked at uh, lower limb bone mineral density uh, when people use the, you know, the up, upright walking type yeah. devices? Uh, and Spongen Group, I know, is looking at it. I haven't seen the results yet. Uh, collaborators in Ottawa are, are looking at it. Um, I haven't started looking at it yet, mainly because uh, people have looked at the impacts on, on bone density and standing frames. And the dose you need to make a difference is really high. Uh, and I'm not doing any trials that I think the dose is high enough for a long enough time to have that impact yet. I have a couple more questions, but I'm going to be uh, quiet for a moment and let other people ask their questions. Michael, please go ahead. Elizabeth, thanks for the nice talk. 
I was wondering about other types of like activities, like mostly I was interested in if the rise in electric bicycles or tricycles is being used in this community as a way to improve mobility. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there, there are actually e-bike wheelchairs, um, the power assist wheelchairs that are being used quite a bit. Uh, in Alberta, the it's it's interesting. I think the take up's better in the U.S. People are used to having to pay for everything, or they have an HMO or insurance that pays for everything. Um, here, Alberta Aids to Daily Living doesn't pay for power assist uh, chair uh, attachments or just uh, when it's built into the chair. So it's only people who uh, were hurt at work or hurt in a motor vehicle collision or otherwise have financial resources that are getting the power assist chairs. But yes, I think they make a much bigger difference to independent mobility um, in someone who has the ability to wheel manually, for example. Uh, so they don't need a big, heavy power wheelchair, but they just need a little power assist to keep them going all day long, to let them go a little faster, to let them do a steeper hill. Um, E-bikes, I have a few patients who are using e-bikes. Again, makes it easier to do the hills if they have troubles, lets them keep up with their friends. Um, I think they're a, a great, uh, a great um, contribution. Um, there's, a, there's a group in Denmark that is an interesting uh, philanthropic foundation uh, that, that I think is buying e-bikes for people with cerebral palsy, which is pretty fitting in Denmark because so much of the infrastructure is set up around uh, bikes for transportation. Cool. And is it easier, like, does to be able to use like a bicycle or with like your legs, I guess you have to be at one of the lower kind of GMFCS scores, like to be able to have the ability to balance a, a two wheeled bicycle as opposed to a tricycle it seems yeah. pretty demanding. Yeah. Now, a lot of the, the e-bikes, especially the cargo e-bikes, um, quite naturally are trikes. Mm -hmm. um, but but yes, uh, but people who are GMFCS one uh, often can run but they can't run and necessarily keep up with their peers. And similarly, some of them can bike uh, and bike a ton and are faster than some of their friends who don't bike as much, um, but they can bike faster uh, with an e-bike. And, and some have difficulty when, as soon as it becomes uh, uphill, even when you shift the gears, they just don't quite have enough power. Cool. Well, it's exciting that the Very cost cool. of e-bikes should reduce quickly over time, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all do. <laughs> and the infrastructure to store them securely. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's a big problem. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll jump in with a question if that's okay, Walter. I had a question about kind of the range of ways that the robotic gate trainers may be used. Like in some of your videos, the individuals are kind of exploring fairly independently. And then in other ones you were showing, they were getting like that sensory feedback to engage with it. Does how they're using it and how much they're being assisted or doing it independently affect some of those neuroplasticity or, or learning measures you've looked at? Uh, no proof that I'm right, but I'd like to say almost certainly so. Um, <laughs> I mean, th there is some proof. We know from general neuro rehab principles that, uh, having something done to you is less effective than being engaged, even if it's being done, but you're thinking about it in the in motor imagery. So um, yeah, as part of one of those grants I told you I'm submitting in the next little bit, uh, I am trying to look at that. And, and anyone else who has suggestions on, on how to do that well, I'm, I'm open to hearing them. Um, great, Carson, please go ahead. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering a little bit about how they sort of tune the amount of support and assistive ability that Trexo does over time. Like, do they have to reassess how much they want to do or is there a setting on the uh, Trexo itself? Yeah, uh, also a moving target. So, so currently uh, deployed are two different controllers. One is completely passive. It doesn't matter what you do. You can engage and they'll measure that the motor's having to do less, but the gate pattern is going to be exactly the same no matter what you do. Uh, and I can tell you, I found that mode really hard to use. Um, it was very, very awkward for me. Um, the, uh, the other mode, they, and they call that mode their endurance mode. 
because in theory, you could go for a very long time. Um, I would just get angry if I had to go much more than a few mo- minutes in that mode. But I'm also used to the experience of walking in my own gait pattern. Um, the other mode they call the strength mode, uh, where uh, it's, again, a path. So there's a trajectory. And if you stay in the range of the trajectory, they're not giving assistance. And as you get toward the bounds, they kick in some partial assistance. And if you get just at the edge, they keep you at the edge with full assistance. Um, But they are, they are, they are working on that and they've actually completely rewritten the next version of their controller is my understanding. And it's no longer trajectory based, but I don't know what it is yet. Do you think it might be four space now, or do they have any way of sensing uh, how much the legs are able to output? They they do not have a way of sensing. Well, they 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 have a way of sensing how much uh, less the motor has to work against gravity, um, essentially. Uh, but they do not have. There are no sensors other than built into their motors on their device. Um, but they do know in real time the, the, the force at the different joints. Now, now, right now, you cannot adjust. You can adjust the speed, but you can't adjust the controller mode unless you stop the device and reset it. Uh, and I understand they're going to have much more... Um, sort of real-time adjustments you can make. Right now, you can't adjust the gate pattern at all, except when the device is stopped. So if you, you notice someone, you really want to try and extend their knee more or something like that, you, you can't uh, adjust that when the de- that device is stopped. And the next controller is much more flexible. Um, but they thought they'd have it to me for beta testing by now, and they don't. <laughs> Thank you. Walter, go ahead. Uh, so as, as you know, the, the thing that I've always been interested in in children with cerebral palsy is the muscles. And uh, so has anybody, you know, and, you know, we have observed like many other people as well, that there is greater fibrosis, is inherent muscle stiffness, overstretched sarcomeres because sarcomerogenesis seems to be impeded. Some structural proteins are downregulated. And, and so um, has Anybody looked at muscles and what impact training with a Trexo or other devices might have on muscle functionality and muscle structure in children with CP? Um, so, so you're, the, the answer is yes. I'm pretty sure I saw something looking at uh, muscle structure related to passive range of motion device, but I don't remember the findings. Um, sorry. <laughs> I, I know it's been looked at. I don't think it was, uh, I think I would remember it if it was something that had a really positive finding. Um, if, if you ever were able to get uh, biopsy samples from children mm. and you know, from spastic muscles of children, you wanted to do a before and after. Yeah. Um, I'd be very interested in helping out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we can, we can, as you know, we can get biopsy samples when they go for surgery. It's unlikely that they would go for surgery before and after because when kids, kids with CP used to have surgery every year practically, and it became known as the sort of birthday phenomenon that, you know, they'd work on an ankle one year and the knee the other year and the hips the next year, and then back to the other ankle. Uh, Now we go for single event, multi-level surgery and try to anticipate all the needs and do it in one big surgery. Um, uh, it's quite possible that some adults might volunteer. Dep- depends on the um, number of participants you need. Um, I bet some of our teens and adults could, would volunteer for sort of a non and relatively non-invasive biopsy because there are people who are really curious about what's going on. Well, it might be interesting just as a very small number as a, as kind of like a pilot study to see if anything actually happens if you walk how, more, if you train small more. Small. One. <laughs> one, okay, one or two, one or two, we should talk. I, I bet we could pull off one or two. We're, we're about to start a trial where we lend families a Trexo for three months. Yeah, and then, you know, and then uh, you, you either don't see anything at all, or you might see some yeah. substantial changes, and then you go, hey, we, we, we probably should build this up for a, for a bigger thing. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Um, 
we, <laughs> we, we should definitely talk. I, I, do, I don't have any potential user who'd be up for that in mind right now, but I need to learn more about what they would need to do and how, yeah, we, we, we should talk. Sounds good. <laughs> Michael, did you have another question? No, sorry, I forgot to lower my hand. My apologies. No I have a Fred. quick, quick yeah. question, um, Elizabeth. So I've seen. Um, first of all, I do I do some like bone assessments and people with spinal mm -hmm. cord injury, and 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 I agree with you. I, I don't think that the stimulus would be that that you know large enough to see appreciable gains in bone, but I. I've seen physical therapists doing the movement of the legs for people with spinal cord injury. Yeah. It's really dynamic and it's like super impulsive and they're moving their legs around really fast. And um, I, I'm just wondering, what do you, what are the benefits of something like that where you have one physical therapist on each leg yeah. Now doing the doing the the control there versus something like the locomat, which is kind of all, you know, automatic and everything. And and that's really where the locomat saw its market when it came out. Conventional body weight sport treadmill training that you're describing typically takes four therapists because oh. you need one on each leg and one taking a rest uh, oh. for each leg, and then they spell off each other. It's, wow. it's, it's very labor intensive, um, uh, but it can make meaningful differences in people who are household ambulators getting more confident or more stable, or maybe people who go from household to limited community ambulation and things like that. So, so, so there are benefits to, to that. And, and really, um, that is when, when the local map first came out, it was sort of marketed as saving therapists. Um, uh, and, and being able to provide a more consistent, repeated sensory stimulus because you can control exactly what they're doing every time um, and all sorts of things. There, there's one bit of qualitative work looking at the pediatric locomat where, where there was a perception actually from the therapist that it was actually more work um, huh. be, be, because the, the degree of setup and thought and planning uh, to arrange for a therapy session for an individual therapist was greater. You probably didn't need four, but you still actually need often two um, to three to get into the locomat and get it all set up and going in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. Okay. That's one of the uh, potential advantages of things like the Trexo. It's, it's one person, um, it doesn't actually take that long to get into once, once, uh, Trexo set up for the individual, um, uh, it doesn't have nearly the control options, um, currently, uh, that the locomat has, uh, the locomat has like some games you can play with it, some virtual reality, you can say all sorts of things that can go with it, but you don't necessarily need the games in the VR if you're walking around school. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Great, I think that'll be a, a great stopping point to, to wrap up this week's HPL seminar. Elizabeth, thank you very much for your presentation and thank you to the audience members for their questions and comments. I hope to see everyone again next week where we will be hearing from Karen Troy from Worcester Polytechnic in Massachusetts.